Welcome to Fire Engineering's Tactical Impact. I'm Jim Silvernell. I'm here with my co-host, Jason Hovelman. Jason doesn't need any type of introduction. We all should know who he is. He's been around the fire service a long time, but I will kind of talk about some of his accolades. Uh, he is a book author. He is the author of The New Company Officer and No Exceptions Leadership. Uh, he contributes to fire engineering, and he is also on the advisory board for FDIC. Uh, his day job is he's the fire chief of the Florissant Valley Fire Protection District. And uh, Jason, it's been a, it's going to be an honor to 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 have the show with you. And thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for the introduction, and and uh, I'm looking forward to this. It, it, as you well know, Jim, that uh, being a fire chief sometimes uh, it's easy to get removed from the day to day operations. And you and I have tried real hard not to do that. So I'm excited about this particular podcast to really just stick to tactics and the operations that uh, we still love and do and, and train on um, that uh, are the root of the fire service. We're very fortunate to have on our inaugural episode, our first guest is going to be retired Deputy Chief Anthony Avillo. Anthony retired from the North Hudson Regional Fire and Rescue. Uh, he really needs no introduction. He's a friend of both Jason and I and uh, well known throughout the fire service. He's the author of numerous books, uh, including Fireground Strategies and Full Contact Leadership. He's written numerous articles for fire engineering, including one we're going to talk about uh, during this episode. And he's also the uh, uh, a co-host with Jim Duffy on a fire engineering podcast. Welcome, Anthony Avillo. Uh, so good. Anthony's done a lot of work. There it is right there, Fireground Strategies. And uh, like I said, he's been around the fire service for a long time, but it is truly an honor to have him here. But uh, we're here tonight, today, to talk about tactics. And uh, uh, Jason, let's kick this off. What are we talking about? Tactics, of course. Of course. What puts out fire? Tactics. That's Nothing right. but no tactics. Gimmicks. Nothing but tactics. Uh, we're not going to talk about gimmicks tonight. Today, we're going to talk about all about uh, tactics and how it relates to you and uh and how it works in your agency um and also um, we're also going to get up some plugs for our our uh, fire engineering here fdic and uh um, and really dive into uh to fire engineering itself um all right so let's talk about tactics a little bit that's going to be the first thing um jason um t let's talk a little bit about about tactics and strategy would you agree that strategy is pretty much similar for all of us in what we do and Anthony, please chime in uh, throughout this conversation. Yeah, I think so. I think the difference is obviously your geographic setting, the resources you have, but the overall strategy is the same. And that's to protect and preserve life and property uh, with the resources and the, the abilities that you have wherever you're at. I, I like how you said the abilities because that really affects something and that affects our tactics. Um, I think one of the important things that we need to talk about is how Tactics can differ from agency to agency just because of your capabilities. And, you know, just if you think that you can fight fire like the FDNY or how you can fight fire like Anthony did, Anthony did in New Jersey, I think you're, you're mistaken from the way we do it in the suburbs. Uh, but really, there's three major variables, I think, that affect that. Um, and, and really, we should bring those up. And that's your, 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 your resources, your staffing levels. And your response here characteristics like you brought up. Um, tell us how a little bit about how staffing really affects your tactical implementation. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's St. Louis County is a, is an odd place. You know, you, Anthony, you'll hit on this a little bit later where that side of the country is really dense. And so that density, even though maybe a small geographic area, is going to require a lot of staffing, uh, even in a small geographic area, because his geographic area goes up. Right. And it's really dense. Whereas where I'm at and Jimmy to, you know, chief of Kirkwood in St. Louis County and props to you, by the way, congratulations, new president, of Missouri Valley Fire yeah. Chief Association. Well done. Um, but Thank you, it, sir. It is, yeah. So the staffing and, and funding plays a role in that. Um, you can't ignore it. All of us would love to have four or five engine, you know, person engine companies and four or five or six person truck companies uh but the reality is that we are uh, bound by the, the the financial resources we have we're also bound by the uh, geographic resources we have um and in some cases for different departments 
uh, retention has been a problem, uh, especially for those combination volunteer departments. Retention has been a problem. It's it's a it's a you know problem throughout the country, especially the volunteer markets. Um, even even in our in our paid departments, it's become a problem. How is it going on there in New Jersey, Anthony? Um, well, you know, I mean, obviously, I come from a career department, but you know, down here in Monmouth County, Bergen County, there are some departments that are pretty healthy. But on the overall, I think it's uh, it's getting a lot more difficult to retain people. Uh, on the fire departments, it's it's. Uh, it, I know people that are on like three different fire departments, and uh, you know they're they're all close together. But it, it it's real difficult to uh, to try and pull that off. You know, you, you need to have like a, a long term plan to retain people, and you know a lot of pe- a lot of departments don't. You know, I, I just think it's a you know lack of planning, and um, you know just. Uh, not, I, I also think it's a function of not bringing the young people in to, you know, be sort of a part of, of the department, you know, it, you know, where, where they, they have a say, they have stake and, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they, they feel home, you know, I think that's a big problem. So when we talk about staffing and Jason, you know, we, we have a lot, many times in the suburban market and even in some of the, the urban markets, we run with three people on our companies. You know, we have three on our engines, three on the ladders, and we'll get into that here in a little bit, what truly is a, a, a truck company. But we run three, and we know, or some people, even in the, the more rural markets, run with two. And uh, we understand the uh, the problems and the challenges that that brings. But, you know, what does that what does that truly mean to us when we run with three people on a company? You know, we can sit here all day long. Yeah, we're short staff. We're short staff. But how does that truly affect tactical implementation? It requires more companies to be on lesser severe. I mean, nothing's routine. We all know that. But we do have, you know, the what we would label, quote, unquote, typical calls that could, you know, maybe what a, a fire that could be four or five fully staffed companies. We have to get six or seven to get all the fire ground functions completed in an, in a coordinated or as coordinated an effort as we possibly can. The problem with that is where we are, Jim, in, in suburban St. Louis County, right outside of, right outside of St. Louis City, I can get six companies within eight, nine, ten minutes pretty easily. You get to the fringes of um, the metropolitan area, probably anywhere in the country, uh, getting six, seven units can take 20, 30 minutes. And so you have to adapt to your your tactics to that you still get things done but you're going to have to maybe do them a little bit different order or assign um you know people to do different things you know in, in succession then they're responsible for two or three functions I, I i can't disagree i mean i can't disagree with that comment at all in fact i completely agree anthony how do you feel about it well uh we we run three-man companies in north hudson there's there's times I think they're running four men on, on some ladders and on the rescue. But, you know, once it goes down to the summer and there's a minimum manning, it's, it's three men on a company, you know, and uh, no, three firefighters on a company. And that, that includes the officer. Uh, so what we've done is, you know, uh, especially for the ladder companies, one company, one task. You know, this ladder is going to the roof. This ladder has got the fire floor. This ladder has got the floor above. The rescue may have the floor above. It's one company, one task. And when we talk about engine companies... Um, we made up the engine companies. Our first two engines stretch the first line. You know, we have an attack engine, a supply engine that takes up two pump operators. And then that leaves four more guys to stretch the first line. And if the fire is above the third floor, we might use the third engine to help, you know. So we that's part of our SOPs. And we, we've we sort of come up with, with you know, you, you have to come up with something that works, you know. You have to be realistic in, in, in what you're trying to do, you know. And, and then going back to what you're talking about, Jay, with uh, trying to get companies in, um, we, uh, we, we're pretty good with that. You know, our response times are really good, although with the traffic and everything, it's getting a little worse. But, you know, Jersey City, Hoboken, all that coming in. But down here, Monmouth County, places like that, um, you know, listen, it, it's all about the response times. That, that's all it's about. If, if, if you're thinking in, in, in any other fashion in regard to your response, you know, uh, 
you know, I, I, you know, we have a lot of departments down here use what we, they call, we call buddy boxes, you know, where a department will bypass four or five departments because he's my friend in that department. I don't like these guys. You know, I, I like to call it, you know, buddies over bodies, right? Let's choose our buddies instead of saving, you know, choose our buddies. And if we choose our buddies, we may wind up with bodies, you know? Um, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's it's the worst of it's the worst leadership you know out there you know and you and you see it a lot in a lot of places but you know the idea is you got to know what you got you got to know where it's coming from how long it's going to get there and then figure out how to get more people there and and not the day of the fire that has to be done you know in 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 setting policy and and working out mutual aid and automatic aid agreements that's when that stuff has to be done so the day of the fire nobody's trying to figure it out because it's too difficult to do when, you know, you got fire and people jumping out windows and exposures and everything else. I like what you said about the, co the combination of companies. And that's really where a lot of our tactics come into differential with the bigger urban environments. Um, you know, when you look at the ideal hose line, you know, it's the, the nozzle, the backup, the boss off to the side in the corners is firefighter. And, you know, you think about that. That's a five person engine company. None of us have that. But when you combine these units together, these these companies together, you can make that happen effectively. Our SOG used to call for first two lines come off right away. Well, think about that. Two lines of two people on going in the front door. The problem is we get away with it because a lot of our fires are room and contents on the same level. But then lo and behold, we get that fire that comes in. It's above grade, below grade, people trapped. You know, you got forceful entry issues. You got ventilation issues. And all of a sudden, those crappy tactics don't work. So, you know, these are the tactics, 100 percent. This is this is where you have to be. You have to really make your tactics work for your, your agency and alter those tactics to make it work. Um, and it goes also back to what you're talking about with the truck companies. You know, we cannot split three person truck companies unless you deadhead the apparatus. And even then you're, you shouldn't deadhead, you know, the ladder if it's in front of the structure. So, you know, you're going to have you're, you're going to have one function. You know, you're either going to the fire floor, you're going to floor above. Or you're going, you can't split your companies. So, you know, you, you're going to have to have multiple companies that are working like trucks. And that goes back to our second variable, resources. Where Jason and I work, we do not have true truck companies. We have, you know, quints, we have engines. Um, I know it's hard to believe in the East Coast that you can't operate a fire without a truck. I'm already ready for it. it and believe me, I would love to have truck companies in every one of my engine houses. But Jason, is that ever going to happen here? Not in my career. No. no, and there's just, a lot of redundancy in that. Yeah. So, you know, in our suburban markets, particularly the Midwest, you don't see that. So therefore, you have to have a standard operating guideline that builds in truck company work. As you know, you know, you have arguments all the time. Well, we don't have truck companies. We don't do truck work. That's a bunch of lo that's a load of, of baloney. You know, truck work is what makes the coordinated fire attack work um, and makes it happen. Um, Hey, what was your favorite job, Jay? What did you do when you came off the apparatus? Did you like doing truck or engine work? I already know this guy's answer, but I'm going to ask him here in a second. It was engine work. I, I was an engine guy at heart, but spent all my time as a captain on a Quint. So I was in a squad company, and I absolutely loved doing the truck work. If I didn't get my if I my crew didn't get a hand on a nozzle, I wanted to go either be fire floor truck or at least getting on a roof. I mean, that was that was the way to go. And I know this answer, but I'm going to ask this guy. What was your favorite work? Oh, uh, the only the real firefighters are on the ladders. <laughs> you know, there it is. I, I, listen, I I was always much better at breaking things than I was at putting things together. You know, I'm, I'm a bull in a china shop, and uh, I my favorite job in, in my entire career was ladder company captain. You know, it was just it was just a great job, and, and you you know you got to see a lot, you got to improvise a lot of times, and and find out what works and you know what doesn't. You know, and uh, you know uh, it it was just it was just what you know what I liked to do. We're going to have a lot more on this in upcoming episodes, uh, but we got to get moving along here. We got a lot in store for you uh, for this episode. But uh, real quick before we go, though, we all serve time as battalion chiefs. Uh, I want to hear about your experiences, Jay, in that battalion chief's car. What what were some of your favorite experiences? And kind of give me a little bit about some of your challenges. You know, you know, did you play traffic cop, or did you watch? Did you watch the SOG happen, or did you have to do a lot of the ordering yourself? 
So to the first question, as far as like, uh, you know, favorite calls or fires, um, they were all my favorite. Any fire I went to was my favorite fire. But uh, it's uh, and unfortunately, we we go to relatively speaking, we were pretty busy up here. But on a couple occasions, one actually we're getting close that time of year on you know, the Fourth of July. I had two two houses going at the same time, um, and that's a it was a good challenge uh, with allocating resources early on to, to solve that problem. And then um, I did, I don't want to say I enjoyed them, but I was always um, challenged with the multifamily fires we get up here, uh, which are fairly frequent. Um, and those in heaven rescues and, and doing that as it relates to, um, as it relates to the traffic cop or the SOG driven tactics, it really would depend on, um, who, who started, it, it was kind of goes back to that as the first line goes, so goes the fire and, uh, depending on how the first company operated would depend on how the following companies would operate. And you said, I always had to just pay attention because my first company might be a mutual aid company, depending on what was going on that particular day. Uh, and so, or I may be the first battalion chief in a different district or different jurisdiction. And so sometimes you have to give those orders, Hey, or, or sometimes it wasn't necessarily giving the order. It was confirming that they were going to do this. Um, so that I knew going in that they were going to do fire attack. The second truck was going to facilitate the first line and get water supply. Third truck was third unit was going to be doing the truck work things. And some, sometimes it was more just confirming that they understood the, their, their role. And sometimes it was giving the order and sometimes it was sitting back and watching it all happen. And it just was kind of, um, it, it was fluid in that regard. How about you, Anthony? Well, when I was a battalion, first I was a battalion in Weehawken and I was a shift commander. So I was actually the incident commander. And uh, my first uh, fire that I had was at the chart house in uh, Weehawken. And it was like a $9 million loss. It was at the end of a thousand foot pier. I had 10 guys showing up. Um, we had, uh, when we got down there, there was 600 people in the place evacuating. Our, our water supplies had to come from the main road all the way down. So we had all these big, long relays. Uh, we had um, fire boats out in the river, um, blowing the fire into the building. It was, it was, you know, it was not, it was all uphill after, you know, it was all downhill after that, you know. Um, but when we got to the regional, uh, North Hudson Regional, and there was a deputy in charge of the shift as a battalion, I got to, to do hands-on stuff, you know. And, well, not hands-on, more sort of uh, I got to play a little more. You know, I'd be an interior division commander on the fire floor. I'd be a roof division commander on the roof. I might be in the exposures, you know. I would be that second layer of supervision around the around the fire area and that was the best part about being a, a, a battalion chief the, the other part that sucked really was you know you're also a, a you know a delivery boy and a paper boy and you know you're in charge of six companies and you're out there delivering paperwork and all that but uh when we had fires that was good that's what i missed when i was a deputy uh, the ability to, you know, not be shackled to a command post and be able to get and, and do some hands on stuff. And, and, you know, um, just kind of, you know, uh, just get that feel of, of the incident. You know, I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about. I like to call Going that a super my... tactical position, those division supervisors, because you're, you're between mm -hmm. that strategic and tactical, but you're still, you know, that, that super tactical position or function, you know, I always like to call it definitely the mm -hmm. most fun super tactical yeah. i going back to my experiences you know one of my favorite things was you know when everything went right i mean not everything goes right on a fire we know that if you sit here and say everything went right you're, you're lying to all of us we've all encompassed we've all had that but you know when you when you're in that car and you know we, we and i will brag we have a very i think very good standard operating guideline here in st louis county that we put together the mutual aid companies work off it pretty well in certain areas I would say most areas, um, but it, it all, you know, everything is taken account for because we don't have truck companies, we have to build in the truck work. But when I was a battalion and I got there and I saw my battalion go to work and they did everything according to the template and also off template because, you know, the guys in the, 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 the people in the front right seat have got to have the ability to make those decisions off template, um, off script, Anthony, to make it work. And I, I think that, you know, when you, when you sit there and you watch that and all I do is watch and I'm like, yeah, this is going great. 
um, I think that that was what really made my day. You know, when when everything went, not everything goes that way, obviously, but um, you know, that's 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 where it, it all pays off. But um, mm. all right, when let's get moving. Right, it looks um, like a symphony. Like it's a like symphony. a symphony when it goes right, you know? Mm -hmm. Or like a, a, a football play where everything goes perfectly. Every, all, the, all the blocking happens and all the, all the, all the parts work out great. Mm -hmm. Let's move forward here. Uh, what's, on, what's on next for the, uh, the agenda here, Jay? So we want to give uh, some props and recognition to the magazine. Uh, the whole reason we're here and what we all grew up reading and and uh, put so much value into over the years. Anthony was an influence for me through Fire Engineering Magazine books and videos long before I ever met him. Um, and we can say that about a lot of uh, the, the people that we've admired and, and uh, they've either mentored us directly or uh, vicariously through the, the, the mediums. And so we wanted to look at Fire Engineering and kind of let people take a look at what the June issue had to offer very quickly. Um, and the issue had some really good stuff in it. The Volunteers Corner, talks about occupational health and sa safety from Brian DeBull um, and, and how volunteer fire service can can uh, be compliant with those things, which can be a very difficult task. I think everything's harder at the volunteer level. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a good article by Tim O'Connor from the training notebook about covering the essentials and training and search techniques, something that we all know there can be a disparity between what some of the textbook teach and what we really need to be doing in these buildings um, as it relates to uh, contact and uh, positioning um, and size. Uh, I don't think enough emphasis gets spent on size of rooms um, as it relates to uh, how we search. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a there was real there was a, a real good FTIC high class once I took on search. I don't know if somebody wants to elaborate on that. Wait, tell us a little about your search class while we're here. Well, it was the, the search class was in the uh, often imitated, never duplicated world-class truck company search. I had, you know, we had great instructors there. Mike Nasta was basically the lead, uh, Joey Alvarez, Jimmy Weiss, um, just just some real, real good guys. And uh, the, the, we did like three or four different stations, but the station you're referring to is, uh, is the Mass Confidence course. And, uh, you know, one of the things we found in the Mass Confidence course was no matter where somebody was from, no matter how much experience they had, whether they were a career volunteer, the mistakes that were made were almost always the same, you know, and it was, it was really interesting to kind of see that. Like, for instance, one of the rooms we had there, the only way out was to go up and out a window, you know, to just move forward, you know, well, it was more like not necessarily a window, but I mean, it was a window, but we didn't make it like a window. It was, it was moving further into the into the building and getting through the course, you know, and I can't tell you how many people just went around that room in circles trying to find a doorway, you know, and, uh, you know, the lesson they learned was you can't find a doorway, reach up and, and find the window. Don't search six inches off the floor. Make sure your hands are going up, you're searching all around, you know. Um, you know, remember in a, in a residential dwelling, you're usually never more than five feet from a window. You know, in a, in a commercial, it's a whole different ball game. But, you know, we, we saw a lot of... Uh, a lot of the same mistakes made, uh, you know, people um, sounding the floor, but sounding the floor with the weight on the tool. So if the tool disappears into a hole, the guy follows it right into the hole, you know, same with missing stairs. But it was it was a real good eye opener. Um, and I still actually in, in, the, in the, all my editions of Fireground Strategies, I use the lessons that we learned. Uh, it's in the last chapter, actually. I use the lessons that we learned in that course, which, you know, I haven't been involved in in quite a while. Um, in the book because it's just such, there you go. They're just such good lessons to learn, you know, and, uh, you know, um, you know, for instance, also, and I don't want to take up all your time here, you know, you find a lot of larger victim, you know, and what you're usually going to find first and, in our in our you know, sort of, uh, uh, frenzy to get that large victim out. There might be a, a kid right next to them or a baby that we miss, you know, same thing with event and to search rather than sounding the floor first, sweep that floor because there could be a victim under that window. These are all things we learned through that course, you know, and it was it was really valuable to us. And, and I'm hoping it was valuable to everybody else. I mean, obviously, you still remember it. I'm sure you still have nightmares about it, but <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun. I really, really enjoyed um, that part of the of the teaching. The reason I was so I was so rudely cut off, Jason, here is because there were, I, there was a correlation between your class and this article. 
I really like how he in the article put, you know, you get taught one way in, in your rookie school, but really reality is something a little different. And when I took your hot class so many years ago, that was really an exposure to, I mean, we knew that searches weren't like you did in the fire Academy. Hey, go to the right side, put your head hood over your, grab the, you know, the leg in front of you and go. And I think he did a really good job in that article hitting that. But uh, anyway, uh, Jay, what else we got in there? Yeah. yeah so an interesting article uh, by Eric Bachman uh, on rural structure fires with, lithium lithium ion batteries and i think the the lesson that you can take from this article um, which i highly recommend is that these lithium ion battery problems are not just in cars they're not just in the urban or suburban setting we're going to see this everywhere and uh it's going to be it's going to be an issue at, indefinitely they're not going away no no it's it's reality no. if you haven't had one you're going to I uh, want to give props to a local fire officer here in St. Louis, uh, the St. Louis metropolitan area, uh, Brian Gettemeyer, captain out of Cottleville Fire Protection District. And he wrote an article that was interesting about, and I'm trying to flip to it here, uh, hand sanitizer as a fire hazard and how it relates to the quantities that are around today after COVID. Uh, that can be cause fire uh, problems for us in our communities where we might not expect it. Did a really nice job with that. Danny shared and it's got a nice article on um, uh, gas leaks. Um, and then finally, uh, the last last one I'll mention before we move forward is uh, an article that uh, kind of breaks down building comprehension from building construction and taking again that legacy education model on building construction and breaking it down into how we look at buildings and uh, identify ways to, to to navigate them to look for points of entry rescue uh, options and um, that is a uh, jeffrey latz um, so check out the june issue of fire engineering if you haven't subscribed uh subscribe whether you want the digital or print it's both the same content great stuff and things that you can go back to over and over and over it's timeless as you'll see with Anthony Avillo's topic uh, today. Yeah, great stuff in this June. Also, there was one on the Ukraine war, fighting fire in a war zone. I couldn't even imagine. I mean, the closest, well, Jason, you were close to a war zone, but not quite uh, during your riot experiences. But, uh, you know, when he makes the point of, oh, yeah, when it's only missiles, and bombardment, we're okay fighting. It's the guns that we have to stop. I mean, I, I couldn't even fathom uh, doing any of that type of type of firefighting. But very interesting stuff, good stuff. And uh, keep read the read the magazine. Get out there, get a subscription. Um, it'll really make a difference in your career. And write write for the magazine tactics. Even though you may have had ground, somebody writes a ground ladder opinion uh, uh, article like Anthony did, there's still other things you can add to it or give your experiences and, uh, you know, send your submission in, get them in. 100%. I, I you know, we, we are really hurting for tactics. Get out there, submit it and, uh, you know, make your little, make your little mark on the fire service for sure. All right, moving right along. Uh, we want to get to our, our main guy here today. And that's Anthony Avillo. Um, Anthony, uh, you and I were together in Canada, and it just so happened you were telling me about an article that you had written in 1999, believe it or not. And it's on one of these topics that you take for granted all the time, but it's probably one of the most critical components in the fire service, and that's gaining access to upper floors, whether it be for rescue, whether it be for functionality. And there it is, Jason's got it, determining target heights for ground ladders, the click system. Um, and uh, I think it, this is one of those, there's a couple of functions in the fire service that show professionalism. One is ground ladders, how you deploy them, forceful entry. I can't tell you enough when I get to a fire ground and I see forceful entry going correctly, or if it's a mule kick, which department really concentrates on their trade. But uh, I, I want we want to talk a little bit about uh, not only ground ladders, but your work in general. But let, let's talk about this article. OK, um, so 1999, man, I can't believe it. But, you know, what's interesting. That article has surfaced and I've been getting a lot of questions about it. It's getting a lot of uh, a lot of traction still. Um, 
I didn't make this up. I, I learned about it at the Bergen County Fire Academy. I don't, I don't know where they got it from, but, uh, but man, it works. And it, it works very, very well. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at, it might have been the maze issue where the, where the guys made the rescue right on the cover of the rescue in uh, Meriden, Connecticut. If you look at that ladder they had, that ladder was at the sill. It looked to me that was a 28-foot ladder. It looked to me, just looking at that picture, that sill was was 22 feet off the ground. So what do you do? You take 22, you subtract 16 from that because 16 is the bed of the 28-foot ladder. 22 minus 16 is 6. Six clicks, you put them right at that window. And, you know, if, if you're going to if you're gonna be on a ladder company, you need to be able to do that. You know, they were able to do that. It's obviously because they practiced it, you know. Um, you know, you look at that, and like I said, I learned it in Bergen County. I, I've well, we've used it in North Hudson. I, I used it in Monmouth County when I was there, and uh, it, it really, really works. You know, it, it, it's based on the fact that the, um, you know, when you when you pull on the halyard and the dogs pass a rung, they make a click. You know, and uh, the rungs are fourteen inches apart, and it's you know, um, if if you're going to raise a ladder to a roof, you know, three rungs over, five rungs over, it's you know, it. it it doesn't matter so much, you know, if you're going to raise one for ventilation, you're a little higher, a little low, you know, it doesn't really matter. But if you're going to make a rescue and you come up a rung short or two rungs over into the window, you're really going to make a, you know, the problem either people are going to jump at the ladder or they're not going to get there and you're not going to make that rescue. So the click system is about being able to pull up on the rig, look at the window that you have to ladder Right from that window, you're going to know which ladder to grab. You're going to know how far away from the building to put it. And you're going to know how many clicks to pull to get it right to that window. And that's what that article is about. It, it requires you to know the bed length of every ladder that you have. And most bed lengths are pretty standard. But, you know, I've seen like ladders that, you know, especially, you know, Monmouth County, a ladder that I've 32 foot ladder, a 25 foot ladder, you know, and, and that's okay. But you have to make sure you know what the bedded length of that ladder. And basically what you're doing is you are looking at the target height, which is generally the window sill, and you work your way down, you know, from sill to sill on most of your buildings, you guys included, 10 feet. Commercial building might be 12. And if you're dealing with, uh, you know, maybe a McMansion or something, you may have to check that out in your own jurisdiction. Maybe, maybe go out and do some drills. Imagine that, right? So, you know, it's 10 feet from sill to sill. And then if you're going to another floor, it's another 10 feet. And then you estimate it to the ground. So, you know, if, if I'm looking at like a third floor window, I might be, you know, 26 feet from the ground, which is then going to tell me I can't use a 24 because that's 24 is better than 14, but I can't use a 24. I can only use a 28 or a 35. You know, 35 is better than 20. 28 is better than 16. 24 is better than 14. When, when I was in Weehawk and we used to write that right on the ladders. So it would say 14 slash 24 so that you didn't have to do any guesswork. You just knew, you know, so if it was 26 feet and I'm grabbing a 35, 35 is better than 20, 26 minus 26 clicks is going to put me right to that window. You know, if it's a 28 foot ladder, 28 feet is better than 16. My target height is 26, 26 minus 10, six is a 26 minus 16, 10 clicks. You know, and what we'll tell people is if you're going to estimate it and you're not really sure, always go up a click or try and use an even click because it works that a little better with the click system that way. But if you go up a click, you can always pull the ladder out a little bit. If you go down a click and you're short, now you got to readjust the ladder. You know, so it, I, I always tell people like, you know, go out and try this. It, it's really good. And if anybody... Um, once that article, you can get it in the fire in on um, fire engineering in the, in the archives, or you can email me and, you know, I can make my email available. available. I have the ladder. I actually have the power, the article. I got a PowerPoint that goes with it and, uh, it's, it works, man. It really does. And, and I'm glad, you know, people are, are aware of it because again, I didn't, I didn't make it up. I just put it out there. So. I've made a couple assumptions over the over the years in both the car and in my position now, and, I, and and correct me if I'm wrong. Do you do you agree or disagree that ladder throwing ladders, ladders in general, are one of the most taken for granted functions on our fire grounds today? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Well, listen, 
when I was a ladder captain and, and in North Hudson, we, they would throw ladders every day, every day to throw in ladders. Why, you know, it's, you talked about like the, the visibility, you know, you can always tell when they screw up a ladder raise. You, we screw up a hose stretch. Nobody really knows. We do. But the public don't know. You screw up a ladder raise. You raise it upside down. You raise it backwards. You drop it. Everybody knows, you know, that you're, you know, um, they always know, you know, you have to be able to raise your ladders. It is, it is one of those things that just shows professionalism. And, and the other end of it is you screw it up and some, you know, somebody could, could be a casualty, you know, including a firefighter. You got a firefighter at a window and a Rick team's raising a ladder and there's fire blowing out behind his ass. They better get that ladder up there. You know, um, what, one of one of the things that I've seen in, in the training is one, the ladder raising is atrocious. It's atrocious. Why? Because they don't they don't do it. We, we run our fire two programs and we have to run a skill day because when we're doing all hands on stuff, these guys, they don't even know how to raise the ladders because they're not doing it when they're training. They're not doing it on the outside. You know why? Because they stink at it and they don't want to do something that they stink at. You know, they'd rather, you know, stretch a dry line around the back of the firehouse because that's what we always do. You know, uh, you, you, have, you have to eliminate your weaknesses. And, and that's a big message there. You made a good point. That's very visible. And, you know, we always we always talk about the Washington Post uh, test. You know, there's going to be a defining time in your career where someone's going to be there either taking a video or taking a picture and it's going to make the front page of the newspaper. Inevitably, it's going to be three in the morning or even during the afternoon, you get somebody trapped on a balcony, someone coming out of a window and you go to throw that ladder and you look like the Keystone cops and no offense against our brothers in blue, but you, you, you definitely don't want to put yourself in that situation and you definitely don't want to take this function for granted. Um, you know, I, I often say, you know, if you look at a building, uh, if you look at pictures on, on, on Facebook or anywhere on social media and you see a lot of ladders thrown on all the corners, you know, a lot, it's, it's a lot of these big departments, you know, like Philadelphia or Boston or, you know, and then you ask them, well, man, they do the ladders really well. It's because they learned through experience that they had tragedy on upper floors or they learn from, from bad experiences and, and don't put yourself in that, ex, you know, in that situation you know, now, you know, throw ladders. How many times have you gone after a fire and you look and you're like, Hey, there's, there's a, there's a ladder on every side of the structure or every corner. You know, I, you, you might be astounded when you take a look and you're like, Holy cow, there's one ladder, hopefully at least one, if not, you know, multiple ladders thrown above grade, especially if you're working above grade, you know, cause we tell our people, Hey, it's okay to do an oriented search above the fire floor, but you better have ways out. You better have a protection of a hose line below but, you know, if you go out and you look and there's no ladders on those upper floors, you're really not doing the brothers inside a service. So I, I think that, you know. No, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, along with that, and Anthony touched on it a little bit, and you guys talked about it with it not being a focus all the time and going out and training. Uh, and, and something that gets discussed in some of the classes I've taken that, that I used to pay attention to is because we don't do it that often, we don't size up the building for ladders very often. And, and the point to that would be you use the longer ladder on the shorter side of the building and then when you get to the back side you realize that the, the the second option isn't tall enough or long enough because not i know some engines in st louis county they only carry a 28 footer that's the longest they carry um and so being able to look and really size up a building for ground ladder placement and you discuss some challenges anthony in your book on um, firefighter fire and strategies on page 12 and you know, just speak a little bit on how you have to take into account elevation, gangways, uh, things of that nature and sizing up the building for uh, putting the right ladder at the right place. Well, one of the one of the things we have in, in our jurisdiction, North Bergen, North Bergen is the second hilliest place in America next to San Francisco. Um, we have hills that that have railings on the buildings. I mean, it's uh, um, it's a, an extremely hilly place, and there's ice there. So 
sometimes if you have a, a, an issue there, you know, you're hoping that you can use the aerial, but then you have wires, you know? So we actually, we have the step chucks and we utilize step chucks when we raise the ladders, you know? When you're dealing with things like parked cars, you're dealing with barriers, things like that, you got to know how to do a beam raise. You got to know how to do a flat raise and a pivot. And these things all have to be done, you know, like, like very quickly, somebody's at that window, you know, it's, it's got to be done very quickly. And, and, you know, we, we, we practiced that all the time. You know, um, we also practiced the one man race. Um, I used to have to, I, I used to race a 35 by myself. Now that's not, I don't condone that. That's not really what it's all about, but you know, um, I think that, um, you have to be prepared to do that. You know, listen, you have to raise it with two people, best to raise it with three, but you have to get done what you have to get done. You're a chauffeur in front of the building and you guys have all their lines stretched in and all of a sudden somebody, even a fireman fighter shows at a window, you know, that engine chauffeur may have to grab that 24 if the RIT team hasn't done it yet, may have to grab that 24 and raise that ladder. So they, they have to be able to do that first time, every time, as, as they would say in uh, Cousin Vinny, dead on balls accurate. Right. It, it, it's got to be done that way. And, you know, um, as a chief officer, I, I'm I was always big on raising ladders uh, because I, I came from a ladder mentality. You know, I came from that raising ladders sort of culture, you know, and uh, when I saw ladders not being raised right. Well, you know, the immediate, you know, if it was a morning fire that afternoon, we're raising ladders and we're going over what exactly went wrong. And we're going to we got to go back to the drawing board. We go back to the drawing board. But you know what? The, when, when you got to raise a ladder for a rescue, there is there is no wiggle room for for a mistake. There's just not. And you see people going and they're raising a the ladder and then they got to pull a little more. They, they have to adjust it. And, you know, it's uh, it's it's. It, it's not it, it's it's not the prime directive, man. <laughs> you know, it's not the in-service and ready status. It's 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 failure, you know, and, and failure is not an option for us. You know, we're not always excellent, but that's where we want to be going. You know, I, I, did I answer your question, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I want to follow up that with another question, though, just for our, our audience. You talk about the click system. Does the click system work the same for a two fly ladder as it does to a three fly ladder? It, it does. However, that's a great question. And, and I, I failed to talk about that. It does. But with a three fly ladder, um, first of all, I don't know why people have the three fly ladders. They're so friggin' heavy. But I know on the Quince and stuff, that's that's usually a pretty common thing. So a three fly ladder, let's say that your target height is 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 24 and uh, your 35. Let's say it's 25. It's an easier one. Your your three fly 35 all right, is, is better at 15. So if, you're, if your target height is 35 and your ladder is better at 15, there's going to be not 20 clicks, but because two sections are moving at once, you have to cut it in half. So it would be 10 clicks. So whenever clicks you come ab about in, uh, when, uh, you know, because the targets, the click system doesn't really take into account the ladder use and you have to get the target height down. You're going to, you, that's footage. Whatever your footage happens to be, whenever you figure out the clicks, you have to cut it in half when you have a three-section ladder. Otherwise, you're going to be going, you know, twice as high as you need to because both sections are moving at the same time. So, okay. And, and again, all this stuff is in the article. You know what we used to say, too? We used to say if you are above the second floor, subtract the click because it moves 14 inches instead of 12. But what we've noticed is don't even worry about that. Just pull the ladder out a little bit. It's not going to be that crazy of an angle. Pull the ladder out a little bit. You always want a little bit less steep angle if you're doing a rescue anyway. You know, so the, above that second floor in the article, it's in there. Um, and I think it's in the PowerPoint too. You, I would say you can use it if you want, but I would say disregard it. The other thing you have to worry about, and, and, and just so remember, elevation at the ground level. Okay. If your ground level grades off at the building, that may cause you to come up short with your click system. So you have to take a look at that, all right? Because sometimes, you know, you might be on a driveway. Uh, you might be where, where it, you know, where it's not uh, concrete or, or, or tar. It's, it's, you know, grass or dirt, you know, and it may sort of slope off. So that's something else you have to consider. But again, all these things are going to have to do with training. 
you got to train on this. You got to look at this and you have to figure out and you got to take yourself out of your comfort zone with, with what you're doing and, and you'll get better every time you do it. So uh, we thank Anthony for being here today. And uh, in, in, in addition to this awesome article, I know we, we go back and forth, but Anthony is a wealth of knowledge for not only the fire service, for fire engineering, um, but he has, he has really uh, performed uh, and he has produced uh, for all of us. Um, we can't say enough about full contact leadership. We can't talk enough about fire ground strategies. But, um, you know, this, this is one of the guys that if you want to learn something about tactics and strategies, Go and find Anthony Avillo. I want to ask him one more question, Jim, on ground ladders. Uh, I appreciate it. You got it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so validate me a little bit, and, and I'm, I'm humble. Yeah. Yeah, and, and because of that, I, want, I know you'll know the answer to this. So there's been there, – there's always been a uh, – I don't want to say a debate, but there's been a conversation, and I, not, I don't think one's right or wrong as you, as you way you set up your ground ladders. As, as people will take the rope – and stretch it and tie it to the bottom rung of the second flies. They don't have all this other stuff going on. Uh, Halyard, yes or no? Tie it, yes or no? Why, why not? Okay, I thought you were going to say solid bore of fog mouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, not, not this time. Um, yeah, I, you know what? I've seen it both ways. Um, I got to be honest with you, I'm not a fan of keeping it tied. Um, I, I think that uh, – while it may save you a step, it also may trip you up if, if something happens where it gets tangled up or something. I'm not really sure. Our ladders are are, are never tied like that. Our ladders are always, uh, are always you know, the halyard is loose. It's, it's, you, you, it's got a clove hitch. Listen, you know what I always think about that? People don't know how to tie clove hitches. So the people that have those things tied already, when they raise those things, ask them to tie a clove hitch. See if they can. If they can't, you know why their ladders are tied. So, yeah. so. I, it, it, it's not as it's not as controversial as the smooth board versus fog, but it is something <laughs> that I've seen different instructors teach. Uh, yeah. both methods, different ways. Yeah, listen, it's okay if it works for you. That that's fine. You know, it's it's that's the beauty of the fire service, man. You know, and, and one one example that was brought up, Anthony, and I've not experienced this personally, though I have heard a firsthand account of this happening is raising an extension ladder uh, that's been extended to a victim who is in distress and grabbing the tip and mm -hmm. disengaging those dog, those mm -hmm. locks um, mm -hmm. that, that could cause a problem is one is one reason, to, you know, to tie the, the how you're uh, as you extend it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've Absolutely. got an experience with that or not. Um, I was not at the incident, but I remember someone telling me about it that happened. But remember that, like, when you take that ladder and you raise it and you extend it and, and all that and you put it into that building, that that halyard's not tied yet if your halyards aren't tied, you know. So that may be an, uh, an argument for tie the halyard, I guess. I, I, maybe, maybe. But that halyard's not tied. However, if you're if you're if you're good at what you do, a guy can tie that halyard in about five seconds. Just zip, zip, zip. It's through. It's done. You know. But uh, yeah, I have heard that happen, um, and I think it happened one time. I, I, I kind of remember someone telling me about it, but I, I wasn't at that incident. You know, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, that that could happen, and and that would be a, that would be a valid argument. You know, I'm I'm not so pig headed. Uh, you know, um, the Joe Pesci. Goes. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. You know. Hey, there's different ways to do things in this business, right? Yeah. Yeah, we, we never did it that way. Yeah, that's the beauty of the different instructors and the different experiences mm -hmm. and getting out mm -hmm. of your own sphere and talking to guys like Anthony and, and different people that do a lot of truck work and, and have a lot of experience with these things. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. So, Jason. If somebody wants to be like Anthony and get their message out there, uh, what what are what's one great way to do that? Well, it would be to write an article for Fire Engineering would be one of the primary ways. Teach a class at FDIC. Mm -hmm. Remember, you got to start somewhere. And a lot of people have that anxiety of submitting. Uh, this year's is already closed. However, there's always next year. And uh, we encourage everyone to, to submit, if they've got a great idea to, to further the fire service, please do. 
um, the next great author, the next great uh, instructors out there. Um, you know, eventually we are going to all retire and go into, uh, you know, live in retirement at some point sooner than later, who knows, but there <laughs> is, but we got to find the next great ones. And that's what fire engineering uh, is so great at mm -hmm. is finding those, uh, that, that talent base. Um, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not as hard as you think. Um, if you ever have any questions, get a hold of somebody. We're all out here on ideas on how to write an article. Uh, create, start with a template, get your idea down, and somebody out there can help you because, um, like I said, it, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of information that we want to get from you. We, we, I've never fought fire in New Jersey. I've never fought fire in Canada. I've never fought fire. I, I want to know how it's done. So uh, tell us how it's done and how you do it and make it happen. Contact uh, Diane and, uh, you know, we get, get, it, get in the article into the magazine. But definitely tactics. We, we need some tactical articles for sure. And the, and the biggest excuse I hear when I talk to people about writing is that they think just because that topic's been written about before that their, their take or perspective on it's not important. And it is. It's just a conversation we just had about the halyard and about – the cl there's all these different techniques and different ways of doing doing things and everybody's got different experiences and the fire service needs and, and wants to hear from as many of those as we can. Yeah, we all started somewhere, you know, we, we all had our first article, you know, I, I that one right there, I think might have been my second or something, maybe, maybe my third, but we all had our first article, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, of have enough confidence in what you're doing to send it in and, and look, you know, sometimes they're not going to accept it or maybe it's going to go online instead of in the, in the magazine. But you know what? Um, everybody could do it. Listen, you, you know, you're not looking at three geniuses here. You're looking at three people that, you know, have passion and, and uh, you know, we, we put ourselves out there and, you know, and we're no different than anybody else in the fire service. You know, we just, uh, it's just like I always say, how do you write a book? One page at a time. Same with an article, one paragraph at a time. Mm -hmm. But I uh, I appreciate you guys having me on here today. This is uh this has been great. You're both really great friends of mine. I love you both. And uh, um, just uh, the the fourth edition of Fireground Strategies will be submitted probably in about two weeks. So hopefully it'll be available by uh <laughs> it'll be available by the next FDIC. I, I don't know. yeah I don't know shameless plug yeah but you know just no uh, it's. It's a well worth it. Uh, you know, we we're glad that uh, you know when we were thinking of uh, our first guest, we thought that uh, you would make the first inaugural episode perfect, and we're glad we did. Um, but uh, Jason, any closing thoughts? No, I just uh, I'm looking forward to to doing this more, and I'm sure we'll have Anthony on again as we move through because again, it's all about tactics and keeping it. And I think the information today, I actually we may have, do ground ladders part two um because i've got other things that that i i can ask and, and talk about as it relates to ground ladders that and and we may do that we may bring you in for part two because we can start Great. getting into selection of and how you how you out, outfit your rigs and what you should be buying and uh the different kinds you talked about one person throws and how how we actually train and do those things and different ideas for drilling um so yeah we'll we'll, we'll, we'll do a part two on this for sure well, and, and, and Duff and I, we have the fire ground strategies and other stuff from the street. And, you know, we'll have you guys on and we'll we'll talk about all kinds of cool stuff. East Coast, what, mid coast, whatever. It, East Coast, no coast. <laughs> mid, <laughs> mid coast. Mid coast. Mississippi yes. River, man. We got the Mississippi that's, River. That's, that's right. The Mississippi River yeah. on, on the banks. But the, what, what's, what's that thing? The arch. That, it would be the arch. The arch. Uh, how about the guy pitching a perfect game last night? Yeah, how about that? Yeah? Nice. Go Yankees. Go yeah. uh, All good. Yeah. Go Blues. Yeah. There you go. Well, I think we can call it a wrap on this segment of uh, Fire Engineering's Tactical Impact. Uh, we want to thank Ed. Yes, go for it. Sorry, Jimmy. How can they get a hold oh, of you? Oh. Okay. Um, I'm on Facebook. Anybody can message me. Hopefully I get it. But my email is, is deputy one, like deputy chief with the number one deputy one at optonline.net. O P T online, all one word.net deputy one at optonline.net. Um, you can contact me. You want, 
um, copies. You want that article? I can I can send it to you. I can send you a PowerPoint that goes along with it. You know, so you can uh, you know train your own people. You know, it's it's all about sharing the knowledge. Nobody owns the knowledge. Nobody owns the knowledge. It's all it belongs to everybody. Which David Rhodes wrote about two uh, two editions ago, I believe. Mm-hmm. Outstanding. Yeah. All right. Any any further closing thoughts? One thing, Jim, I failed in my duties at the beginning of this podcast to formally and and, and dutifully introduce Jim uh, of who he is. He he did a good job introducing me, and I skipped the line uh, on my little agenda here. But if you don't know who Jim Silvernail is, you've not been paying close attention. But uh, number one, a very good friend and, and person I've looked up to for a long time, uh, but also fire chief at Kirkwood Fire Department in, in St. Louis County. And then also author of Suburban Fire Tactics, which uh, mm-hmm. is probably 80% of the country and has had a huge impact on us. But don't let him fool you um, with, with all those uh, those accolades. He's a he's a down and dirty firefighter at heart who I've actually we've come up to the fire service St. Louis County together. It's been a lot of fun. And I enjoy this opportunity. And I, I'd say the same about you, buddy. But uh, now, thank you all. And uh, I think we've... Uh, had a really good show. And yeah, uh, if you, you have thanks any, so much, man. We love you guys. Thank you, man. If anybody has any uh, thing they want to talk about on the next Tactical Impact, please find Jay and I, and uh, we will get you on the agenda, and we will talk tactics. But for now, I'd like to thank everybody and sign off. Thank you very much.